I'm Dr. Fakir Avari and this is Pharmacokinetics and Pharmacodynamics of Vancomycin in Adults. The first learning objective is explain the pharmacologic, pharmacokinetic, and pharmacodynamic properties of vancomycin. Vancomycin is a giant molecule. It is a tricyclic glycopeptide. It binds to the D-allo D-allo residue of the pentapeptide cell wall building block and therefore inhibits cell wall synthesis, resulting in bactericidal activity that's relatively slow when you compare it to beta-lactams. For the most part, the activity of vancomycin is against gram-positive organisms. So gram-positive organisms such as streptococci, enterococci, with the exception of vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, methicillin-susceptible staphylococcus aureus, as well as methicillin-resistant staphylococcus or MR MRSA. Vancomycin does not have activity against any gram-negative organisms as well as it does not have activity against anaerobic organisms such as bacteroides. It also does not have activity against any of the atypical bacteria. As I mentioned, vancomycin binds to the allo d allo residue of the peptidoglycan layer and therefore it inhibits formation of peptidoglycan layer. As you can see in gram-negatives, there is an outer membrane above the peptidoglycan layer. And vancomycin is a huge molecule. And because it's a huge molecule, it cannot go through the outer membrane of the gram-negative organisms. And therefore, it cannot touch the peptidoglycan layer in gram-negatives. Therefore, vancomycin does not have activity against any gram-negative organism. It only has activity against gram-positive organisms. Here's what the peptidoglycan looks like. Note that this is a mesh of basically building blocks of the peptidoglycan. Those building blocks are basically G and M. So N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramic acid. And the way that these... Uh, this peptidoglycan mesh is formed is that these bu uh, building blocks will actually cross-link with each other and overall it will create this mesh. And what vancomycin does is that vancomycin will actually bind to these building blocks and when it binds to these bu building blocks it actually inhibits cross-linking. So because there will be no cross-linking because vancomycin inhibits that then there will, no there will be no peptidoglycan layer formed. Let's take a look at vancomycin pharmacokinetics. Vancomycin oral absorption is negligible. So therefore, if you administer vancomycin orally, it will stay in the GI tract. It will not be systemically, systemically absorbed. Sometimes this is a good thing. For example, if you're treating clostridioides um, difficile infection in the, um, in the colon, it's actually, we actually give oral vancomycin and it's good that it actually stays in the GI for, the, for that infection specifically because the site of infection is um, in the GI. For all other infections, oral vancomycin has no role. So vancomycin for all other uh, indications, it needs to be um, administered intravenously. For the most part, vancomycin pharmacokinetics it shows a lot of variability in patient in different patient population, including protein binding and volume of distribution. It is renally excreted for the most part, so renal function is very important when it comes to vancomycin um, therapeutic drug monitoring, just like aminoglycosides. And the half-life of vancomycin in someone with normal renal function is about four to six uh, hours. And it will be extensively prolonged in someone with renal dysfunction. Before we talk about vancomycin, it's important to understand two compartment pharmacokinetic model. So in the one compartment model, you basically administer the antibiotic and it will stay in the central compartment. One compartment model is very straightforward, so you can do the kinetics very easily. Because aminoglycosides are hydrophilic, they, their pharmacokinetics are very close to one compartment model. So for simplicity, you can assume that aminoglycosides show one compartment model. Although vancomycin is also hydrophilic, it actually has the ability to distribute into tissue. So it can actually penetrate different uh, tissues. Therefore, vancomycin shows a two compartment model. So one compartment is the central uh, compartment, which is basically circulation. And then the second uh, compartment is when vancomycin goes from the central uh, compartment to the uh, periphery tissue. So the periphery tissue is that second compartment. This is significant because as we administer vancomycin intravenously, it goes into the central um, compartment, which is uh, circulation. Uh, and uh, normally it will be eliminated through the kidneys. But however, because it's also penetrating into the peripheral tissue, 
there will there is also the distribution phase so when you give vancomycin initially the peak will be very high and then during the distribution phase the levels drop very quickly and then it kind of slows down during the elimination phase this becomes extremely extremely important when we decide when to get our levels so we want to avoid getting level into the distribution phase, which typically takes about two hours. CLSI is the Clinical Laboratory Standardization Institute, uh, which is the organization that sets standards for laboratories, including microbiology laboratory. So in this table, we're looking at the susceptibility breakpoints. Breakpoints basically are the points that we use to interpret MICs. So when we get a vancomycin MIC for a specific organism, uh, you know, MIC is just a number. We should be able to interpret, for example, if we say the MIC is 1, we need to be able to interpret it as, you know, is that what does that 1 mean? Does that mean it's susceptible, intermediate, or resistant? And these breakpoints depend on the organism. So for Staphylococcus aureus, which is the number 1 reason for using vancomycin, the susceptibility breakpoint is set at 2. So an MIC of 2 or less is considered susceptible. So for example, if we send a sample to the macro lab and they determine that the MIC is 0 0.5 for Staphylococcus aureus, then we would say that because it's less than or equal to 2, it's considered susceptible. Whereas if that MIC comes back from the lab and it's actually 4, then we say, well, 4 and 8 are actually considered intermediate. So that's how you would interpret it. For coagulase negative Staphylococcus, the, uh, the breakpoints are actually higher, so an MIC of 4 or less is considered susceptible. The same is true for Enterococcus species, so MIC of 4 or less is considered susceptible. For Streptococcus, the breakpoint is actually 1 or less. And these are the latest 2019 uh, CLSI breakpoints, and these numbers get updated annually. And these numbers haven't changed uh, in years, so it's unlikely that they will change next year. So these are the three common PKPD indices. So we have peak to MIC ratio, AUC to MIC ratio, and time above MIC. For vancomycin specifically, AUC to MIC is the PKPD target most uh, associated with uh, efficacy. So AUC to MIC is the, is the index that we use for vancomycin. However, you want to achieve a specific number. So for Staphylococcus aureus specifically, we want an AUC to MIC ratio of 400 to 600. So you want it to be at least 400. You also don't want it to be too high uh, because of toxicity issues. So ideally between 400 to 600 uh, is recommended by the 2011 IDSA guideline, as well as the 2020 ASHP IDSA guidelines for therapeutic monitoring of vancomycin, which were finally published earlier in January of 2020. And then the, um, there are different methods to actually measure MIC. So the, these numbers are based on the broth macro dilution reference method of uh, getting MIC. And the AUC is ideally in this, uh, for a 24-hour period. So from the time of initiation of uh, vancomycin up to 24-hour period. So that's the area under the uh, concentration curve that we would calculate. Now, historically, it has not been practical to calculate AUC. So what uh, a lot of guidelines have done, they have used trough as a surrogate for AUC to MIC. Uh, especially that 2011 guideline used trough as a surrogate for AUC to MIC. So as you see different guidelines for different infections, they instead of AUC to MIC target of 400 to 600, a lot of these older guidelines actually have trough targets. So they would say for severe infections, a trough target of 15 to 20, and for less severe infections, such as diabetic food infection, uh, 10 to 15. However, the 2020 guidelines actually do not recommend targeting a trough. Uh, they actually recommend uh, targeting AUC to MIC of 400 to 600. However, uh, it is important to note that these guidelines only make recommendations for severe infections. They don't make any recommendations for non-severe infections because of insufficient evidence. But it's important for you to know that there are a lot of guidelines out there, specifically older guidelines, that are targeting troughs. And most hospitals in the US are actually following these uh, targets. So you need to know all these targets 
uh, because uh, any hospital that you go to, they may be targeting these numbers, so you should be familiar with them. In the future, it's likely that hospitals will slowly uh, start to transition to targeting AUC to MIC of 400 to 600 for Staphylococcus aureus specifically.